Undeniable, Part 2. We've been discussing the book Undeniable by Douglas Axe, which is subtitled How Biology Confirms Our Intuition That Life Is Designed. Uh, it's uh, by Harper Collins, and uh, there's a scan of the cover. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to take that four-page, uh, uh, four, yeah, four-page spread and and whittle it down a little bit. Uh, for a summary, Douglas Axe argues that the key to understanding our origin is the design intuition, the innate belief held by all humans that tasks we would need knowledge to accomplish can only be accomplished by someone who has that knowledge. For the ingenious task of inventing life, this knower can only be God. There is science that proves our de design intuition is valid, and we'll go into a little bit of it. Everyday experience can empower ordinary people to defend their de design intuition. Living creatures are brilliantly conceived, utterly beyond the reach of accident. That's a short summary of what the book has to say. We're going to start with Chapter 3, Science in the Real World. Determined to resolve the conflict between the design intuition and Darwin's theory, I spent much of my spare time from 1988 to 1990, the end of my PhD years, reading as much as I could about evolution. I wanted to know who else was waiting against the stream, and I was encouraged to find a few impressive skeptics. Several of these skeptics had given talks at a symposium organized in Philadelphia back in 1996 under the eyebrow-raising title, Mathematical Challenges to the Neo-Darwinian Interpretation of Evolution. Marcel Schutzenberger um, from uh, the University of Paris, Stanislaw Ulam at Los Alamos National Laboratory, MIT's Murray Eden, people who aren't easily ignored. Their talks, transcribed and published the following year, presented thoughts at various stages of refinement, these short papers lacked the weight of finished research projects, but to my mind, they amply demonstrated the need for such projects. Slightly troubling was the fact that in the 20-some years between the symposium and my reading of it, nothing as healthy as that uh, gathering seemed to have occurred again. A few brave books in those years had challenged evolutionary, uh, the evolutionary story on scientific grounds, most notably Michael Denton's Evolution, A Theory in Crisis published in 1985. But the apparent lack of any gathering of scientists at an established scientific institution to carry this critique of Darwin's theory forward suggested to me that the scientific establishment was not at all in favor of it. I was in. If opposition prevented me from openly stating my aim as I embarked upon this dangerous career path, then I would keep my aim private. So you have a sense of his um, the challenge he felt in a number of different ways. What I found most intriguing in the small body of technical literature that challenged Darwin's theory was the improbability of characters becoming arranged into long functional sequences by accident. This is exactly what made us so suspicious of Oracle Soup, and that should be a yellow ellipsis. The same intuition, the design intuition, applies to functional sequences built from any kind of character set from the zeros and ones of computer code to the hieroglyphs on the Rosetta Stone. Fascinatingly, the molecular underpinnings of life provide two more prime examples, gene sequence and protein sequences. We'll get to the genes in a minute. Each protein molecule is a long chain of connected characters called amino acids. These amino acids are small molecules with standard connectors on both ends and a protruding part in the middle. The 20 natural amino acids differ only in those protruding parts, which I'll refer to as appendages. And he has a nice drawing of amino acids and hooking together to form proteins and so forth. Uh, if the sequence of amino acids along a newly made protein chain has the right properties, the whole chain folds up automatically, or nearly so, he mentions uh, chaperone proteins, inside the cell to form a compact three-dimensional structure. The preferred shape of each protein turns out to be specified by the sequence of amino acids along the length of its chain. But that raises an interesting question. How do cells know what these sequences should be? The answer lies in genes and the genetic code. Each protein molecule is constructed by leaking, linking amino acids according to sequences, sequence instructions carried by a gene. 
There's a trick to reading these genes. I'm sorry. Um, instruc genetic instructions, though. DNA consists of four types of characters joined in sequence, whereas proteins consist of 21 amino acid characters, uh, 20 amino acid characters joined in sequence. A code is therefore needed for cells to translate sequences of four into sequences of 20. Life has precisely such a code, the famous genetic code that was cracked in the late 1960s. And they have a figure for that as well. As we trace the source of proteins back, we see that the genetic code explains how the sequence instructions for protein are encoded in their genes. But that raises another pressing question. How did the various forms of life acquire these necessary genes in the first place? Here, our design intuition clashes with the scientific consensus, which attributes genes and proteins and everything else to accidental causes. As Michael Denton put it, the intuitive feeling that pure chance could never have achieved the degree of complexity and ingenuity so ubiquitous in nature has been a continuing source of skepticism ever since the publication of The Origin of Species. There are, in fact, both theoretical and empirical grounds for believing that the a priori rules which govern functions in amino acid sequence are relatively stringent. If this is the case, it would mean that functional proteins could well be exceedingly rare. And by the way, these are uh, Doug Axe's ellipses. <clears throat> As it can easily be shown that no more than 10 to the 40th, uh, one followed by 40 zeros, possible proteins could have ever existed on Earth since its formation. That's, you know, figure out how many bacteria and how many other, uh, other organisms and how many proteins that you have them. Um, this means that if protein functions reside in sequences any less probable than 1 in 10 to the 40, it becomes increasingly unlikely that any functional protein could ever have existed by chance on Earth. Simply put, it seems likely to Denton that protein science was poised to disprove Darwin. I agreed, and I wanted more than anything to do this science. Within a few years, my pursuit of that ambition took me to Cambridge, England. Working first in the Department of Chemistry at Cambridge University, I soon came to realize that opposition was not the only thing that had kept scientists from settling the matter Denton and others had raised. The kinds of experiments that were needed were easy to describe in theoretical terms, but they turned out not to be so easy to nail down in practical terms. A lot harder to do than it sounds. The basic idea was to put Denton's claim that functional proteins could well be exceedingly rare to a decisive test. Doing this would require more experience and more careful thought. In pursuit of this experience, I eventually landed at another major research center in Cambridge, this one having a rather extraordinary history behind it. Uh, the humanness of genius. Housed within an unimpressive box-like building at the south end of Cambridge was the highly impressive Laboratory of Molecular Biology, or the LMB. Within months of opening its doors in 1962, the LMB could boast three Nobel Prizes shared among its scientists. Fred Sanger was the sole winner of the Chemistry Prize in 1958 for his discovery of the amino acid sequence of insulin. The second and third prizes both came in 1962, one going to James Watson and Francis Crick for discovering, along with Maurice Wilkins, the double helix structure of DNA, and the other going to Max Perutz and John Kendrow, keep that Max Perutz guy in mind because we're going to run into him again, for discovering the first protein structures. Many more LMB Nobel laureates have been named since then. So this is a rather prestigious laboratory. In September of 1999, I paid a visit to an office at the LMB that reflected the character of the man who occupied it, humble and tidy. Max, that's the Max we referred to previously, stood opposite me, slightly hunched, using a wood lectern to support himself. Pain in his back made sitting difficult. Indeed, his body showed all of his 85 years, but his mind and his work schedule were those of a much younger man. On his lectern were 26 sheets of paper, <coughs> that represented more than a year of my work. I was taking a calculated risk. A prevalent idea at the time was that proteins were not particularly fussy about the sequence of amino acids along their chains, and even less fussy about the identities of the amino acids that end up on the outside of their folded structure. 
Any, according to many scientists then, all a protein needed in order to fold was an appropriate placement of water-loving and water-repelling amino acids appendages along the chain. About five of the 20 appendages can be classified as water-repelling, and seven or so can be classified as water-loving, the rest fall in between. So you can see how this simplified view would, if correct, make it much easier for evolution to find amino acid sequences that fold to form new protein structures. In effect, the, the difficulty of arranging 20 kind of kinds of appendages into a stable structure would be reduced to that of arranging just three kinds of appendages, water-loving, water-repellent, and ambivalent. And then, of course, a couple special ones in the middle that, that need to be uh, specific in order to make the enzyme work. My paper opened by connecting this simplified view to work Max had done in the, pardon me, my paper opened by connecting the simplified view to work Max had done in the late 1960s. I knew this connection could backfire, though, because the rest of the paper described experiments that clearly showed the simplified view to be incorrect. Even I found this result surprising. My experiments have been performed on two different enzymes, the general term for proteins having, that perform specific specific chemical transformations. Having shown in 1996 that a particularly small, particularly small enzyme continued to do its chemistry even after all its interior amino acids had been randomly replaced with water-repelling alternatives. And he has a reference there. So he started out by bunking with the internal ones. And you know what? They were right. It didn't matter. I had assumed the exterior would be content with any combination of water-loving amino acids. This turned out to be untrue. Shortly after I started the work, it became clear that most, both of the enzymes I was testing were completely inactivated after just a fraction of their exteriors were replaced in this haphazard way. I responded by redesigning the experiments, carefully replacing exterior amino acids in groups of five or 10, not haphazardly, but with alternatives that were the most similar, let's say an aspartic acid for glutamic acid. Uh, again, both the enzymes were ruined in the process long before their exteriors had been fully replaced. So the inside didn't matter too much, but the outside mattered a great deal. The fact that the amino acid replacements were now very conservative made this a significant result because it contradicted the prevailing view so clearly. These two proteins were much more fussy about the identities of the amino acids on their exteriors than I and most scientists had assumed. Uh, moreover, the method by which I had shown this suggested the same was true of other proteins. This was not just specific for those two proteins. In short, I had shown the ability of proteins to keep working together after a small number of their amino acids are replaced. One of the main justifications of the simplified view didn't mean that these changes were harmless. It only meant that harm had not yet reached the breaking point. Kind of reminds you of uh, Sanford's uh, argument. The breaking point is always reached as more changes are introduced, even changes of the conservative kind I was using. My hope during the week or so between handing my paper to Max and sitting down to hear his thoughts was that any unease this new finding might stir in him would be offset by his appreciation of the clarity of the result. If all went according to my plan, I would leave the room with a strong endorsement from one of the greatest scientists alive, which surely paved the way for my paper to be published in an elite scientific journal. This was not to be. I listened politely as Max, in a state of mild agitation, complained about things that, to my mind, had nothing to do with the substance of my work. The man I'd hoped to impress was annoyed instead. And again, I, that's my ellipsis. Thankfully, other, expert views, uh, other experts viewed my paper more favorably. One of these, himself a prominent protein scientist at the LMB, described my findings as, quote, both startling and convincing. So after passing the test of peer review, my paper was published in the Journal of Molecular Biology in August of 2000. Yeah. This is peer reviewed. And we'll look at that after we get done. Much later, with the benefit of years of reflection, 
I came to a new understanding of my meeting with Max. As difficult as our interaction in his office had been for me, I began to realize that he had shown me something more important that day than anything I had been hoping to show him. What I learned will sound too obvious to be profound, and indeed, although it is obvious, it happens to be one of those obvious truths we can easily lose sight of. Max Perutz, the small giant who deservedly occupies a position in the history of science well above that of most Nobel laureates even, was as human as you and I are. Somehow, with the conferring of rare honors, with the establishment of the scholarship funds, and with the dedication of buildings that bear a person's name, with oil portraits and marble busts and postage stamps bearing a person's likeness, with the passage of the person in the flesh and the growth of a legend that to take his or her place, somehow the fallible aspects of humanness we most easily relate to evaporate, leaving us with an image that hovers midway between heaven and earth, neither divine enough to be worshipped nor human enough to be hugged. Perhaps this tendency to idolize the legends of science is connected to a skewed view of the whole scientific enterprise. Many of us, including me, have been brought into that, have bought into the idea that science, though practiced by humans, has managed to rid itself of the human flaws that leave their mark on every other human undertaking. The purity of science is guaranteed by the rigor of the scientific method, we think. As astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson described this utopian view as follows in the first episode of the Cosmos, a space-time odyssey television series. This adventure is made possible by generations of searchers strictly adhering to a simple set of rules. Test ideas by experiment and observation, build on those ideas that pass the test, reject the ones that fail, follow the evidence wherever it leads, and question everything. Accept these terms, and the cosmos is yours. That all sounds very nice. And if ideas could be tested with a meter, the way batteries and fuses can, then Tyson's simple rules would work. But if we intend to question everything, perhaps we should begin by questioning whether the human testing of human ideas can really be so simple, considering how complicated humans are. Oh, it is until the results don't go your way, and then it gets complicated. Nowhere are these complications more evident than in destruction, pardon me, this discussion of big ideas that touch the way we live. Because here we find that everyone, scientists included, has a strongly held view. And the very biggest ideas are those that offer answers to the all-important question of how we got here. We should try by all means, pardon me, we should by all means trust the scientific community to tell us how many moons orbit Neptune or how many protons are packed into the nucleus of a cobalt atom. Why would anyone distort facts of that kind? Matters where everyone wants to see things a certain way, however, are a completely different story. With those, we should always apply a healthy dose of skepticism. In other words, it's reliable until when you really need it. From utopian science to authoritarian science. Having not yet come to appreciate this human factor fully, I was quite confident by 2000 not just that the scientific facts were at odds with the evolutionary story, but also that with the right protein experiments, I could reverse the stream of scientific consensus by proving so. I hadn't done this key experiment yet, but I knew how it would be done. Holding a utopian view of science, very much like the one Tyson describes, I was convinced that no matter how startling a scientific result may be, no matter how many scientists may react with incredulity, or how many textbooks may have to be rewritten, science always sides with the truth in the end. And maybe it does. But had I seen myself as less exceptional, recognizing that many other scientists had offered similarly weighty challenges to Darwinism for well over a century, I might have reached the sobering realization of how long the scientific community can take to settle on the truth. Oddly enough, I now see how the pursuit of prestige, so evident in my own life, goes a long way towards explaining how science gets stuck on certain wrong ideas. In the professional world of science, prestige is bestowed in the form of praise, and not just any praise, but the rare praise of those who are themselves most highly praised. Knowing how fickle praise can be, though, why would anyone assume that praiseworthy science always gets the praise it deserves? The sight of true words eliciting a strongly negative response is familiar to everyone. In all walks of life, 
Why then would anyone believe that the road to scientific truth and the road to scientific prestige are one and the same? The answer, I think, is that when we fall for the utopian view of science, truth and prestige do appear to be on the same road. If we assume scientists are single-mindedly driven by the quest for truth and nothing else, then we expect those scientists with the keenest perception of the truth to rise to the top. These top-notch scientists form an elite body of experts whose consensus opinion is the surest indicator of the truth there is. Prestige and truth then seem inseparable as though they are just two different names for the same destination. And when we need only follow the road a pardon me, and we need only follow the road a short way towards this def destination to see that it is also the road to authoritarian science, which of course if you think about it is the exact opposite of what science professes to be. With the truth perceived to be so reliably in the hands of the elites, we ordinary folks need not concern ourselves with the details when the elites are challenged. Instead, we wait patiently for them to deliver their official response, which is sure to be correct, we assume. Of course, as a challenger of the consensus view of biological origins, I had to concern myself with the details, but I was strangely confident that the challenge I was mounting would compel the scientific authorities to concede out of sheer inability to oppose the truth. Confidence can be a good thing, but in retrospect, I can see that mine was tainted with pride, which is not a good thing. I say this because my intent in showing you the less flattering side of science is not to make me look good or others look bad, and certainly not to make science look bad. My purpose is instead to, provide, to promote a realistic view of humanity and science as a human undertaking. What happened next turned out to be not just the right medicine for my, uh, turned out to be just the right medicine for my pride, though not the sort I would have prescribed for myself. Um, and then we come to chapter four, outside the box. Under the directorship of Alan First, who I mentioned in chapter one, the Center for Protein Engineering, or CPE as we knew it, occupied a building that was joined by a connecting corridor to the brick box that housed the LMB. For the most part, the engineering done by the 40 or so scientists at the CPE consisted of designing small alterations to natural proteins in order to study how their chains fold into compact, compact structures. One project, though, had a much more ambitious uh, form of engineering in mind. While I was doing the work that led to the 2000 JMB paper, a colleague of mine, Miriam Altamirano, was attempting to re-engineer a natural enzyme in order to make it perform the function of a different enzyme. Like many other scientists at the time, she was using a hybrid approach that combined aspects of design with aspects of evolution. In all these projects, the idea was first to make informed guesses as to what parts of the original enzyme should be changed and how, and then after implementing these changes, to use a standard laboratory version of evolution, that is mutate, select, and repeat that process, to sort out any minor problems. Although the strategy could work in theory, the limitations have become increasingly apparent in the years since. Eleven years later, some of the leaders in the field conceded that, quote, efforts to date to generate novel catalysts have primarily demonstrated that we are good, getting good at making bad enzymes. Making good enzymes will require a whole new level of insight or new methodologies altogether. The crux of the problem is that the evolutionary step at the end accomplishes so little that suggests risks almost entirely on the ability to make the right guesses in the first place. But of course, if we knew how to do that, the evolutionary step would be largely superfluous. In other words, evolution seems to be an inadequate replacement for knowledge. Indeed, if our design intuition proves true, nothing is an adequate replacement for knowledge. Very good informed guesses, however, are tantamount to knowledge. And in this case, Miriam's guesses seem to be that good. She found that her evolved engineered enzyme worked as well as the natural enzyme it was designed to imitate, a remarkable feat in a field where the term success usually has to be applied very generously. Miriam submitted her paper for publication in Nature around the time I met with Max Perutz. Her paper passed Nature's peer review and appeared in February of 2000. This is a peer-reviewed article. 
a group without a leader. Hoping Miriam's strong success would pave the way for more success, as is often the way in science, several PhD students began to work under her supervision on projects that extended her method to other enzymes. But technical challenges began to present themselves, and just as this was becoming evident, the students suddenly found themselves without a leader. In late 2001, Miriam unexpectedly left the CPE. Pardon? Um, yeah, now her students are kind of left. As the director of the CPE, Alan knew that he would have to find someone to take her place. And since his own work had never focused on protein evolution, he knew that he would have to look to someone else. The rapid three-year timetable for completing a PhD in the British system made the situation all the more urgent for the students who had been in her charge. That's kind of an interesting point. You don't get to sit there for seven years working on your degree. Knowing that my work was increasingly touching on protein evolution, Alan approached me. After stressing the significance of Miriam's work, underscored by her paper in Nature, he spoke with me about the students who had been stranded without Miriam, ending with words to the effect of, you know a lot about protein evolution, Doug. I knew he was offering to hand the leadership of this group of students to me, but I didn't see how I could accept. Although Alan saw that I was doing careful, critical work that touched on protein evolution, he didn't know the details of my current project, and he probably underestimated the degree of my evolutionary skepticism. Miriam's group was abuzz with the idea that evolution could work wonders, whereas I had come to the opposite conclusion. How could I lead a group of people who seemed to be heading in, in a direction opposite of mine? The indirectness of Alan's offer enabled me to decline indirectly, which is not my usual style. In this case, however, I took the easy option. By not saying I would lead Miriam's group, I conveyed to Alan that I wasn't interested in leading her group without having to explain why. Um, and uh, then science with ambition. I had been proceeding with caution for a long time. Even before that aha moment I recounted at the beginning of chapter two, I had been a quiet critic of materialism. My views were known to close friends, but they went no further than that. Written declarations of my thoughts were restricted to the bulletin board in my student room, which was cluttered with personal proverbs. And you might not be able to pick these out. Uh, one was a higher version of the design intuition. It is intuitively obvious to me that a mere collection of atoms cannot obtain consciousness. It can never become aware of its own existence. Another supported that higher intuition with a simple argument. I deduced from the reality of human free will that humans can't be material things, and therefore man did not evolve from the physical, at least purely. I never intended to keep silent forever, though. My plan all along was to continue thinking and working carefully in the hope of solidifying my early design intuitions and eventually earning the opportunity to communicate them publicly. If and when that time came, I was sure that science would be the best podium from which to speak. My utopian version of science wasn't contradicted by anything I knew at the time. I understood that people had their biases, and I had seen the prejudicial attitudes of anti-faith scientists, but the scientific arguments in defense of the design intuition seemed incomplete to me, and because I felt a certain, com a certain a complete argument could be made, I held to the idea that this argument would be widely accepted. Now, if you're wondering whether it's, a legitimate, it's legitimate for scientists to hope for particular results when they set their goals, I can assure you that it is. We do this all the time. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence is a well-known example. The study involves the work of many scientists who hope their search will one day prove successful. And he gives another example of finding cures for various diseases. But in a box statement, he says, science come, hard, harm comes to science not by people hoping to find a particular result, but by people trying to suppress results that go against their hopes. A perfect storm. In early 2002, scarcely a month after I passed up Ellen's offer to assume leadership of Miriam's group, there was discussion in the LNB cafeteria of a possible problem with the results reported in Miriam's Nature paper two years earlier. 
it sounded serious. A, group, a graduate student who had been sorting through the storage tubes in Miriam's freezer had found that the labels on certain critical tubes didn't match the contents, and most troubling of all, the re-engineered enzyme that had received so much attention seemed not to work. A sinking feeling descended on the whole lab at the thought of several graduate students having spent a year or more of their precious time on projects that were predicated on a mistake. Within days of the first mention of inconsistencies, the nightmare was confirmed. And there's a whole list of what had happened. By accidental cross-contamination, a few cells of the strain with the natural enzyme had been mixed in with cells that couldn't grow. This meant her positive result wasn't really a false positive. A brief note of retraction soon appeared in nature. We conclude that the results are unsound. As if these internal events were not creating enough tension, this is the group that he turned down the, the leadership of. The intelligent design of view of biological origins was beginning to make headlines in the UK in connection with escalating controversy over the teaching of alternatives to Darwinism in state-funded schools. As my boss, Alan knew that I had been receiving fellowship and research money from the major funder of ID work, the Discovery Institute, for several years. Alan had earlier mentioned the Discovery Institute website, so I presumed he had made the connection himself and was not bothered enough to discuss it with me. But the hostile treatment of ID by the British news media seemed to ha be having an effect on him. I was the first person in the lab one morning in February of 2002. Alan usually made his rounds through the labs later in the day when work was in full swing, but on this morning he dropped in early to have a word with me. He seemed tense. He approached me as if there were a pressing matter he needed to discuss, yet he seemed unable to initiate the discussion. I assumed that what burdened him was the question of whether he could allow me to continue my work at the CPE, knowing that I was a part of this thing being portrayed so publicly in such awful conspiratorial terms. There's no easy way to inter initiate a conversation like that, but any other conversation would miss the point, and if my future at the CPE was indeed the point, the point was missed. After mentioning that he had just listened to a BBC radio program discussing intelligent design, Alan put a few questions to me somewhat awkwardly. You know this William Densky fellow, don't you? Yes. And you know about his intelligent design theory? Yes. Tell me, then, who is the designer? This, that was the top question asked by critics of intelligent design back then. They thought the answer would expose deception on the part of ID proponents. Their underlying assumption was that ID proponents were being coy about the identity of the designer of life in order to construct a version of creationism that, by avoiding the G word, could be taught in American public schools. In reality, the question only exposed confusion as to what ID is. How to spot a fake ID. The truth is that ID and creationism has always differed fundamentally in their methods and starting assumptions. Creationism starts with a commitment to a particular understanding of the biblical text of Genesis and aims to reconcile scientific data with that understanding. ID, on the other hand, starts with a commitment to the essential principles of science and shows how these principles ultimately compel us to attribute life to a purposeful inventor, an intelligent designer. ID authors settle for this vague description not because they want to smuggle God into science, but because the jump from intelligent designer to God requires something beyond the essential principles of science. The confusion over ID really stems from, a broad, from broader confusion as to what these essential principles are. Intelligent design takes a minimalist view. If science is the application of reason and observation to discover objective truths about the physical world, then doing science requires accepting just a few things, none of them controversial. First, we must accept that objects, objective truth exists as we naturally all, uh, all naturally do. Then we must accept that some of these truths pertain to the physical world, and that some of these that do can be discovered through human observation and reasoning. Since we all engage in this discovery process from an early age, we all naturally accept these propositions. There's nothing more. In fact, adding anything to this essential set of pro uh, propositions causes serious problems. Uh, and there's more, of course, to that paragraph. 
as odd as the situation may seem, it's not hypothetical. The scientific view, as in scientism, introduced in the first chapter, is the most striking example of an embellished version of science that has risen to prominence. The reason adherence to this version holds science to be the the reason adherence to this version holds science to be the only legitimate source of truth is that they also hold to materialism. This commits them to the idea that there isn't anything but physical stuff. And because science is the only way to know the truth about physical stuff, this leads them to conclude that science is the only source of truth. The materialist commitment itself, though, is completely unnecessary to science, and therefore, in Axe's opinion, in mine, a harmful embellishment. The Ides of March. Alan's questioning didn't seem to lead anywhere on that February morning, but the mounting tension surrounding intelligent design in 2002 and the way this tension amplified the problems caused by the collapse of Miriam's result left me thinking my time at the CPE might be coming to an end. If I could somehow become the solution to these problems, though, my position would become secure, I reasoned. I had passed up the opportunity to lead Miriam's students because our projects were pointed in opposite directions. Now that their projects were on the verge of being abandoned, however, the idea of salvaging them by viewing them in reverse seemed promising. In other words, if I could get Alan and the students to consider interpreting their results not as proof that converting enzymes to new function was easy, but as proof that it was hard, then I would be happy to provide the needed leadership. I proposed a meeting to discuss this idea. Alan was very receptive, as were the students, so the meeting was scheduled for the final work of week of February 2002. My gross underestimation of the difficulty of getting people to change the way they think in an hour or two is humorous to me now, but none of this seemed funny at the time. With visuals prepared and the outlines of my argument well rehearsed, I took up the challenge of convincing the Herschel Smith Professor of Organic Chemistry at Cambridge University, who also happened to be a fellow of the Royal Society and the director of the Cambridge Center for Protein Engineering, along with a half a dozen graduate students, that their view of protein origins was incorrect and that the failed projects could be combined with my project to make a strong case for the correct view. Needless to say, my pitch was not a smashing success. Years later, an article in New Scientist magazine about Biological Institute, Biologic Institute titled The God Lab, and that should be five uh, reference, revealed that one of my fellow scientists at the CP had been pressing Alan to dismiss me because of my connection to ID. The article says Alan refused to do so, quoting him as saying, I have always been fairly easygoing about people working in this lab. I said I was not going to throw him out. What he was doing was asking legitimate questions of, about how a protein folded. According to the article, I left the CPA after quote, acts and first were in dispute with each other over the implications of work going on in first lab. Truth is that Alan did in the end give in to the internal whistleblower who wanted me removed, though I certainly accept his account of having resisted this for some time. When he finally did act, I interpret the awkwardness of his action as an indication of his reluctance. There was no heart-to-heart -heart conversation or even a word spoken face-to-face. When everyone gathered in the customary way to bid me farewell, abs Alan was conspicuously absent. All I received was an email from Alan's assistant on the 11th of March, 2002, succinctly stating that the CPA was, quote, very short of bench space, lab bench space, and declaring Alan's solution, quote, please vacate as soon as possible and by the end of March latest. Evidently, they needed space matched, the needed space matched my dimensions exactly. So after saying my goodbyes to everyone present, I said goodbye to the CPE and to the brick box at the other end of the corridor, the LMB. Conscious and courage. The truth is that I may well have made the same decision if I had been in Alan's position. After all, challenging the evolutionary story was my calling, not Alan's, and I am the one who accepted the risk of pursuing research I knew would lead to a confrontation with the scientific establishment. Since I had never consulted Alan on that aspect of my direction, it would have been presumptuous of me to think he would be willing to shoulder some of that risk himself. 
Further confirmation of the risk came from all directions over the course of the, that week in March 2002. The Guardian, a British newspaper that some of you know, on Friday of March 8, said, Fundamentalist Christians who do not believe in evolution have taken control of a state-funded secondary school in England. In a development which will astonish many British parents, creationist teachers at the City Technology College in Gateshead are undermining the scientific teaching of biology in favor of persuading pupils of the literal truth of the Bible. Uh, Newsday said, in the meantime, Intelligent design advocates have pointed to a third line of research as, the, quote, the most promising development in the next few years, end quote, and another potential roadblock to evolution. The research by Douglas Axe of the Center of Protein Engineering in Cambridge, England, introduces a concept called extreme functional sensitivity that relates a protein's specialized function to the changes permitted in its amino acid sequence. Axe's premises, that's their words, are hinted at in an article published two years ago in the Journal of Molecular Biology, but Dembski and others say Axe plans to go public with his full findings as, as soon and, quote, shake things up, end quote. I had said nothing so provocative. Newsday reporter uh, Bern Nelson had asked a question, and I was careful to restrict my response to what was presented in the paper. I don't think the data presented in the JMB paper allow one to draw this conclusion. That paper does reveal that the constraints imposed by function on sequence are unexpectedly high, and this raises some important questions that need to be explored further, and which I hope to explore further. Um, I don't know how you make up stuff like that. I guess if it's all in a good cause, it's OK. Um, Indeed, as I had just disclosed to Ellen and the graduate students, I was exploring those questions further, and I had a sense of where the results were pointing, but the last thing I wanted to do was to compromise my research by talking about unfinished work with a reporter. The media storm soon dissipated, and in the end, I was able to con complete the project I described to Ellen and the graduate students at the Babraham Institute loaded just, uh, located just outside Cambridge. Like the prior study, this one was accepted for publication in JMB, appearing in August of 2004. So score that for um, a second paper in favor of uh, concepts that are friendly to intelligent design. Peer-reviewed, no less. The tension continued after the storm, though, and still continues today, as is the scientific interpretation of this tension. According to this now familiar view, people of faith who challenge Darwinism are really pushing religion, even if their challenge has a scientific look to it. That being so, we need to warn everyone not to be deceived by appearances. Blow your whistles. The religious agenda is the enemy that threatens science, and so all enlightened people should defend science against this enemy, we're told. The real problem for science, however, is not people having agendas, as they always do, but rather the institutionalization of agendas. Something even greater than science is at stake here. To see this, we need to go back to the question we considered at the outset. To what or to whom do we owe our existence? University of Washington psychology professor David Barash is teaching his kids. With professorial authority, he declares to his young captive audience, the more we know of evolution, the more unavoidable is the conclusion that living things, including human beings, are pr produced by a natural, totally amoral process with no indication of a benevolent controlling creator. Wow. If this explanation turns out to be untrue, then his indoctrination is a predictable tragedy. Barash believed, believes the falsehood that was instilled in him because, when he was a student, and having believed it, he dutifully assumes responsibility for instilling the same falsehood in other young people. But the fact that his actions are predictable makes him no less destructive. And he lists some of the destructive things that could happen. And then he finishes the formal uh, chapter with, heroes are badly needed here and we have every reason to think they will take their conspicuous stand in each generation. After all, having whistles blown on you is a small price to pay for the privilege of defending the existence of moral truths. If you think these heroes need to have PhDs, I hope to convince you otherwise. 
in the next chapter. When it comes to defending the big question of our origin, everyone is scientifically qualified. Now, there's a letter to Doug Axe and a letter reply. Doug, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I get the feeling, call it body language, that you're avoiding directly answering my questions. I think you know what I'm asking. You've indicated in the past that your work has nothing to do with ID, yet your affiliations and conversations with Dembski seem to indicate otherwise. You can't have it both ways. Are you sort of quietly or unobtrusively trying to get ID-friendly research into the literature, or are you not? Are you afraid that be, by being openly supportive of ID, your, your reputation will be besmirched among your colleagues? Frankly, the fact that Dembski keeps mentioning your work even though you claim no link to IDs smells sort of fishy. So what's going on? And then there's that quote, we will first understand how simple the universe is when we recognize how strange it is. And that's a quote by John A. Wheeler. Uh, we miss you, Carl. I assume that that's Carl Sagan, although I don't know. And here's uh, Doug's reply. I've been away for a couple of weeks. In answer to your questions, I've been neither ev evasive nor inconsistent. I'm open to the possibility of an evidence-based design argument in biology, and that explains the connection to this Discovery Institute. At the same time, I, have, I've, I haven't yet seen the evidence to justify such an argument, and that explains why I haven't put such an argument forward or defended arguments that others have put forward. Like you, I'm well aware that preconceptions can color one's thinking. Perhaps unlike you, though, I'm also aware that since we all have them, we're all susceptible to their influence. Sympathy towards design arguments is no more capable of clouding the, the mind than antipathy is. In the end, I'm much more interested in whether arguments are good or bad than in the personal reasons behind the errors and the bad ones. To tell whether an argument is good or bad, you don't need to worry about what may have unduly influenced someone's thoughts. You simply examine the argument. Regards, Doug Axe. Okay, now I should have put my uh, usual thing. Uh, this is my take. I agree that one doesn't need a PhD to have a valid opinion or even to do good research. It does help to have a PhD to be believed. Belief is not necessarily directly proportional to the evidence, however. Um, Axe actually makes a good case that science in general may be biased. Um, and uh, with that, I will just say that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Okay, I have a couple of comments over here. Um, I have a few extra copies of uh, uh, the paper by Daniel Toad. He's Darwin's Malthusian met metaphor and Russian evolutionary thought. Anybody who's interested? Okay. Um, that somebody left that paper uh, on the front here. And I have no, uh, well, I, I know who it is, and I haven't had a chance to look at it, so <coughs> I'll leave that for a, a, a separate time. Anyway, in the meantime, uh, Ariel, you had something to say. Uh, there's so many interesting things here in connection with this chapter. But I, I thought I would uh, <coughs> raise a little bit the, the sensitive question that comes in here so often. Uh, it is claimed that, you know, by, by the intelligent design folks, that, they're not getting into religion. They're they're just analyzing it, and uh, of course he made the point that there's a difference between intelligent design and creation. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is an interesting uh, continuum, actually. I think where it's hard to draw the line in the sand, uh, but. Uh, I would approach it from this perspective, and that is uh, when science limits 
intelligent design. And intelligent design limits creation. Are we not following kind of a, a same pattern of limitation of possibilities? And is that not a restriction of academic freedom? Uh, and is not, is, can you say that there's no way to find truth when you start restricting possibilities? Well, uh, actually, I, um, I tend to agree with the, uh, uh, the argument. In fact, uh, one of the interesting things is that as I hear them describing creationism, I find myself not being described accurately. Um, and because I think that if there were enough evidence against a creation uh, that I would be compelled to leave it in the realm of, of myth or, or fable. And I'm, in fact, I think that there are a lot of people out there that are the same way. The reason that creation science actually exists is because there are some evidences that point towards a short age for life on Earth. Um, and I think that it's a... I, I think that it's a mistake to ignore the importance of those evidences. That... You know, Richard Dawkins is famous for saying that evolution uh, enables uh, one to become an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Well, I think that in a similar manner, that creation science allows one to be an intellectually fulfilled creationist. If it were not there, one would be simply in the blind faith area. And it is important how those how those experiments come out because I think that uh, they do influence how we look at uh, the world in general. Um, and in fact, it's one of the criticisms that I have of Bill Nye, uh, or pardon me, of uh, Ken Ham when he was when he was um, debating Bill Nye is that he allowed Nye to ma manipulate him into saying, well, we believe the Bible. And, um, and of course, you know, that kind of, that kind of answer just will not cut it for a standard scientist. It won't. Um, and for those of us who live every day of our lives in science, I think it's much, a, better, a much better proposition to do what Doug the Axe is doing here, pointing out that there is science and there is science. And that when scientists don't have a particular reason to argue about the number of moons of Neptune, then their reports can be taken more or less straightforwardly. And nobody really gets upset if we find a new moon going around Neptune a little further out than we expected. On the other hand, when science is supposed to, supposed to be touching upon where we came from, then you're dealing with an extremely explosive, uh, um, and it's kind of like, you know, okay, there are liars and there are truth tellers, and then there are people who will tell the truth most of the time, but if it comes right down to it and it's involving something that's really important to them and they realize it, they will lie. And that unfortunately is where we are, uh, what we've run into in science, is people who are, um, well, not lying in the traditional sense, but oftentimes by omission, by, uh, by emphasis, and things like that. And they're lying to support a position that's near and dear to their hearts. And it shouldn't really surprise us that that is a common human behavior. And so Doug has made, I think, a, an excellent case for people who, he's doing great work. It's getting published. 
but you know you're associated with those creations and we really can't have that in this lab. And so in spite of the fact that what I've seen you do looks good, I'm going to have to let you go. And in fact, as the point that was made is that he didn't even have that conversation directly with Doug Axe. He gave it to his secretary to write an email saying, please leave. It, it just, and, and afterwards you can sense, you know, because you heard in the first chapter they'd actually reestablished some rapport. It's not that it was personal to him. He just was very uncomfortable with what was going on. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, Doug was going, doing good work. Doug was a nice fellow to be around. But, you know, a combination of, and it's hard to tell how much, his personal convictions <coughs> and his sense that scientists were expecting him to have those convictions were enough to make him dump Doug in spite of uh, otherwise good work. A uh, couple I, of, I we have a comment back here in the comment here and then here. Go ahead and... Uh, I thought there wasn't enough lab space. Pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it is amazing how the lab space was precisely fixed by that one change. Um, go ahead and then uh, move it back and then uh, uh, Warren. I just thought it would be appropriate to express all our appreciation that you are reviewing this particular book. But not surprisingly, it is also being reviewed elsewhere in Adventist institutions. I just noticed last night that Spectrum is reviewing it and that the tone of voice in which they're using is not quite as admiring as yours. The fact that, they, that Douglas Axe winds up actually identifying the Creator, which is a little unusual for intelligent design literature. Yes, it is. Very unusual. As a matter of fact, they seem to go out of their way not to, and in court say, who, God? Never. Some other. It could be karma or some unspecified spirit. But the fact that... Uh, Douglas Axe does actually take the leap and identify God as the designer is a source of some distress to our fellow Adventists reviewing that book in Spectrum. Well, it's very interesting. Do they have an alternative designer? What's the problem? Well, that, that, that is an interesting question. For an Adventist, what should be the problem? I'm not quite clear on that, the answer to that question. Uh, that's, an, that's, a, that's a question to ask them, I guess. They, they do have a comments page, so you can uh, pull it up and, and ask them why are they so distressed about this. Ever since intelligent design was given birth to this world, the world of thought and so on, and research. Um, there's been a lot of confusion, as we've noticed, between ID and creationism, especially scientific creationism. I'd like to float this idea just for comment and see if it makes sense. I would suggest that they, the two groups are on parallel tracks, but going opposite directions. Now, let me use an analogy of a freeway. You can be on the same freeway. You can tell everyone, I'm on the I-10. <laughs> but whether you go east or west makes a world of a difference. Now, methodologically, I would suggest they're going different directions, just methodologically. ID, ID wants to start purely with science. Work out of a lab, use scientific method, start with science, and then push it to its limits until you have no alternative but to see a design, a designer amongst the design. So ultimately, 
you're moving toward religious faith on this one lane of the freeway. Scientific creationism, as I know of, and I'm not commenting on Evanist creationism now, I'm looking at AIG and some of the other groups. Basically, you start totally opposite. You start with scripture as your starting point. And then you move beyond the confines of scripture and you want to move into the laboratory. You want to make your research respectable and showing that there is scientific evidence supporting your biblical views. So kind of you're going two opposite directions in terms of starting point, but there are a lot of similarities, similarities too. And I'd like to uh, hear your comment or any others that would like to comment on this idea. Well, uh, you want to pass the mic back? Um, yeah. Let's see, maybe. Okay. And uh, my, my own opinion is that, uh, that I actually like the um, intelligent design approach because I think that that's where many people start from here. And, and it's kind of, in a way, one of the claims that's being made in the Bible is that the Creator is, in fact, the God of His creation as well as the God who may speak and can speak and does speak sometimes. And so uh, the, the fact of the matter is, let, let's, let's take the, the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Elijah was told to uh, you know, convene everybody at a, at a meeting that could be witnessed, and then to propose, if you like, a scientific experiment. Now, Elijah is starting from a belief in the God of Israel. But he knows that a lot of people there kind of are not really of that belief. That it's kind of their halfway. And Elijah knows also that if in the end, the priests of Baal can call a fire down from heaven, and he can't. He is toast, quite possibly literally. Um, and it won't matter whether there is a God who uh, created the world. What will matter in that situation is that the God was not enough of a... Uh, was not enough, in enough contact with nature to make it bend to his will. In fact, it would be interesting to think what would they do if neither Baal nor Yahweh had had an altar burn or a sacrifice burn. And my guess is the people would have said, fooey on both of you, you're both wrong. And, uh, and so... And so the, the, the entire contest is one that says the God of your fathers is, in fact, the God of everything. And that your, da God, your fathers did not worship a mythical God that can't do anything. And so you can start with, well, he must be a God, so therefore he'll do this or that. Or you can start with, well, nature is made by somebody and uh, the somebody will probably have these characteristics and God seems to claim there's these characteristics and so we can test them. Good analogy. And, and so, although in some ways I can see the difference in how they start, and I think that the ID people are in fact starting with science, that that they that because they're coming from opposite directions, they actually do eventually. Uh, if things are going right, they will wind up meeting in the middle. And you know, if if each of them, so to speak, conquers intellectual territory, then when they do meet in the middle, they have the whole ball of wax done. Wherever the middle is, whether it's 
easier to come from the scriptural end or whether it's easier to come from the evidential end. Uh, they eventually do meet in the middle. And this is the thing that bothers atheist scientists is because they know that if you give ID enough rope, it will hang them. And this just cannot be allowed, and so therefore we are perfectly legitimized in fighting off these people any way we can, including firing them from uh, uh, protein labs or firing them from their position as tenure-track professors. Or if you can't do that, like they can't do to Behe because he's already got his his tenure, they can insist that there's a big thing in front of his website that says, Lehigh University doesn't have anything to do with this stuff. You see, uh, and you do what you can, and you know if that involves uh, professional uh, destruction of somebody, that's fine because they're doing the wrong thing anyway. It is, uh, it is every bit as uh, biased as a, as a witch hunt. Yeah, um, I mean, I'd point out that it's not just, uh, you know, there, there are certain scientific uh, areas that are, are given to, to this, you know, scientific misconduct, not just origins, but there's, um, like I think research uh, in some of the sexual uh, areas uh, is you got to take with a grain of salt because there's you know probably some biases behind that. Uh, I, I would throw in creation, um, climate as well. I think it's I, a very I think that climate serves political. a certain kind of uh, eschatological service. Right. And right. and and yeah, you you have to take those with a grain of salt. Now that doesn't mean there isn't any truth to them, but it does mean that you have to be careful of the institutional bias that may be reinforcing and quelling the dissent of others. Right. Yeah. Uh, there is a there is a kind of a mythos, and you can paint it. The creation story is a part of it. Um, sexual freedom is a part of it, and. Uh, the uh, terrible threat of global warming is a, another part of it. And that's not to say that the environment isn't a good thing. That's not to say that, uh, that let's say, certain kinds of religious strictures on, uh, on uh, sex are, are necessarily good. Uh, but it is to say that that these things have been taken over by people for whom the results must be there. And so they go beyond simply checking out their results to the point of suppressing opposing viewpoints, suppressing opposing evidence. And I think that, uh, that that's where you get into trouble. I think that Axe nailed that particular one right on the head. Comment there and a couple over here. In this comparison of, of ID and creationism, I, I think a little different approach, I suggest, is, is helpful. Um, uh, those in, in, in ID, there are those who are Bible believers and those who are not. And, and so they all have their, their ideas. Including um, there's a, a Paul Nelson is a full-fledged yes. uh, short-age creationist. And, and, and the, the creationists, there are those who uh, want to be involved in science, those who are not. They don't care anything about it. But I'm interested in those who, who um, want to be involved in science. And I would suggest if you look at that group, uh, they're not going opposite directions. They're going exactly the same direction. But the, the ID defines their, their, their question a little more uh, strictly, they realize you science cannot. They 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 correctly realize science can't tell us anything about God, so they're asking a restricted question because you can you can pursue that with science. Okay, among creationists, 
actually, uh, those that I know who are involved in science, they are doing the same thing, but asking a broader range of questions. Mm -hmm. You still cannot use science to demonstrate God, but there's a broader range of questions that, that can be asked that go beyond the, the restricted question that ID is asking. And you can also take your, your biblical views to give you suggestions for research. And that's the same thing that ID is doing. It's just that one group is, is asking just one question that should be able to be recognized as valid science. It just, oh yeah, the, it, it should be. The other group can, should be also, but it's, it's, it'll be more difficult for many people to see it. Uh, you know, and so that's what I see those who are involved in science are, are doing. Yeah, and, and I, I, I think that I, I think one of the things we have to d watch out for is to avoid the trap of getting pushed into a position that says, you know, the evidence doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I've got the Bible. That's all I need. Um, I think that uh, I think that the Bible can suggest scientific ex experiments, and if it suggests them and they come out as expected, that lays that adds weight to that kind of interpretation of the biblical record. Um, I think we have to be fair and say sometimes the evidence could come out differently and if it is, we don't suppress that and we don't um, and we, we don't uh, try to say that everybody who is against uh, you know, who doesn't see things our way is therefore, uh, you know, obviously meant, uh, morally impaired and therefore should not be paid attention to. Um, I think we have to be very careful about how we, how we deal with that kind of thing. And we have to be very careful when we are checking the results that we don't put our thumb on the scale. It does prove that the thumb has weight, but I'm not sure that has anything to do with whether the whether the uh, one side weighs more than the other. And uh, one thing to, to consider, um, when we take a religious point of view and suggest hypotheses from it, we need to avoid the trap of thinking that because we got an idea from that source, we'll always, the experiments will come out, always come out the way we think, because we're human and we don't really know. And so we might come up with bad hypotheses, um, which is not, a criticism of the source it's just because we're human limited human but um, and if we if we're in a, in a war like we are if we if our hypothesis comes out wrong we'll get shot shot at <laughs> uh, whereas others may not but but still the the, the process in the long run uh, I believe will always make progress if we're coming from a correct um, base from our work from our ideas and eventually it will come out better. And I agree with that. Comment over here and then uh, Ariel. <clears throat> Something has bothered me about this question for a long time, probably as long as I remember. And that is this, you may know that I grew up in Yugoslavia while under communism before communism fell. And everything was assumed that had to happen by evolutionary method. That's the way to improve society. That's the way to improve life. That's the way to get life. That's the way for everything. Anybody who actually believed in God, while belief in God was not strictly forbidden, it was considered <coughs> in very negative terms, in the sense that people who actually believed in God were somehow running against the interests of the society. Are we, are we losing the, the, the mic here? Yeah. <coughs> uh, back to life. Uh, please note that it required intelligent intervention for the mic to come back yeah. to life. You, you realize this, yes? It did not happen okay. by diffusion 
or by random chance of batteries making their way into it. Okay. Now, the problem, however, that I'm, I'm unclear about is why the hostility towards the idea of God? Yes. Oh. Okay. Oh. Are you looking for some keys? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I won't run the dog. Yeah. Okay. See, the question is, why is there such hostility towards even a simple idea of God? It strikes me as being somehow strangely paradoxical that people with an open mind believe that the whole universe could quite easily pop out of nothing into something, but the idea that some intelligence might actually be behind it is immediately anathema. I find that very difficult to grow. Why is chance somehow given greater authenticity than actually an intelligent person? Is it not true that anything that can happen by chance can also be intelligently caused? <laughs> the reverse, however, <coughs> is not true. You, you follow where I'm coming from. So why is it that somehow we feel that an exclusion of intelligence, when in fact large proportions of government resources are spent on gathering intelligence, mm -hmm. yet when it comes to science, we think that we're progressing by excluding it categorically. How does that train of logic work? And how is it supposed to bring us to a better insight? You're getting into basically a religious question. And I think that's what it boils down to is that there are some people who are not, do not like the implications of of believing that there could be an intelligent designer because it doesn't take a lot of thought to start asking, well, what kind of a designer would it be? And it's clearly a designer that's better than we are right now. And uh, that means that it is, from that perspective, God-like. And there, I think there are a lot of people who had hoped that they'd put God to rest once and for all. And the idea of having to accept that they didn't actually get rid of him is very disconcerting <coughs> on a number of different levels. But, but, the question, but the question is, why do they imagine that getting rid of God will somehow improve our lot? Well, that's, uh, that's a good question, but uh, I don't think they have thought through it that far. Um, I, I really don't think that, uh, that they've asked the kind of question, of, well, what if everybody did just what they wanted to and nothing more? What would that do to society? Uh, those are kinds of questions that they prefer not to, not to deal with in great detail. Uh, and and how badly they prefer not to deal with it is obvious by the way many of them approach the question. Um, uh, they use simplistic stuff like, well, religious people have killed millions of people. Well, yeah, but so did Stalin, who's arguably not religion. Or Hitler before that, who is, if anything, pagan and probably not even that good. But, you know, it's those kinds of, those kinds of things that, that are relatively easily s seen through arguments that keep coming back again and again and again um, that tell you that these people are not really thinking critically.
Well, I, I simply might add, uh, in my book, Science Discovers God, look at the last chapter, I give seven different reasons why scientists prefer or have rejected uh, the idea of a God and a creation or design and so on. Uh, among the most paramount ones uh, are delicate ones that uh, you need to be careful because they're not always the case, but there's a, there's a question of the our personal pride uh, science prides itself, you know, as being the final source of truth uh, so much. And also the question of our moral responsibility. Uh, I think those factors uh, affect these people you're talking about. I mean, of course, most people believe in God. Uh, but uh, in the practice of science, uh, it tends to be a dominant theme, that God does not exist, or at least that he's not allowed. Uh, so uh, there are many other factors. Uh, historically, we know we're in a materialistic mode of thinking right now. Uh, you know, back in antiquity, reason was the big thing. Uh, our Aristotle, a little bit of an exception to that. But uh, in the uh, scholastic period, authoritarianism was the dominant thing. Now we're in a materialistic mode. And uh, so we find a lot of peculiar thinking in all these different areas. We need to rise above these trends and be open to all ideas. To me, the, uh, the key to finding truth is to be, uh, at least uh, expect truth to make more sense than error, and also uh, to be open to all ideas. Uh, one more comment. And okay. then, uh, I'd like to continue my metaphor of the uh, superhighway and mm. the two lanes, or eastbound and that westbound traffic. Um, there is a division between the two groups, and uh, Dr. Brand just pointed out that there is a different emphasis in the way we ask questions. That's very important. Mm -hmm. There's also a different emphasis when it comes to questions like age of the earth. Um, the ID people, as most of you know, they couldn't care less whether the earth is old or young, whether life is old or young. Most of them. Paul Nelson is one exception, but most of the time that's not a central issue for them. The central issue, did God create it ex nihilo? Did he create ex nihilo? Uh, I, don't, I don't even think that they, they, they would bother themselves as whether God created ex nihilo or not. Well, I'm using a theological yeah. term. I'm, I'm not I, using a scientific but, term. Uh, you that know, you're derailing me been, from my have messed in comments. matter various ways. Yeah. No, I, I'm using that in a technical theological sense. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you press it, the matter back, there is a beginning. Yeah. And God had to create. And creation is, by definition, ex nihilo, right? Well, yeah. I yeah, think if you define what the classical definition of creation is. Yeah. So when you look at it from the point of geology, which I'm partly a geologist, not very much, um, intelligent design doesn't do a whole lot with geology, whereas scientific creationism has a whole lot of say with geology. Right. Why? Because of the age of the earth. Why? Because of catastrophism, uh, Noah's flood, and all of these issues. And so there's a different, there's almost a barrier in the middle of the road when it comes to age of the earth issues, I see. That's why intelligent design people have not given blanket endorsement to scientific creationists. Right. But it's mutual. Scientific creationists have not given blank an endorsement. They like certain aspects that help confirm uh, a creationist um, understanding. But there's still some reservations, and there is a divider in that highway. That's yeah. all I'm saying. No, there, there, there is. Uh, 
I think the, 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 at least in my opinion, the best of the creationists recognize that intelligent design does a great service and is worthy of being supported. And that, uh, and also that the, that the critique that says you need to start with the science if you're going to bring scientists along, I think is, is a valid critique. Uh, and there, uh, not only does creation science exist, but it is in fact an important point if you're dealing with scientists who start out not being creationists. The, uh, you know, if, if I could not point to examples such as finding carbon-14 in very old material, I would not, I, you know, I don't know whether I would change my belief that much, maybe some, but I certainly would not be vocal about it. You know, I would, uh, well, we kind of believe this, so we can't prove it, but uh, whereas now I'm quite comfortable, hey, you know, we want to challenge it, let's do the experiments. And, uh, and it's interesting because Elijah did exactly that kind of thing uh, on Mount Carmel. He said, you know, you've got, a, you've got a question of which one is God. Well, let's see which one can start a fire. And intuitively, it was, it was experimental and it was appealing to the audience. Now, I'm pretty sure that Elijah hadn't had a lot of experience with uh, burning altars before this. But he had experience with the God who could say that, and I'm pretty sure that he didn't run off with this idea on his own. That it had been something that somehow God had, if not started, although, of course, God starts everything in some sense so that that would still be true, but that God also uh, had somehow sanctioned, yes, this time you, go, you, you do the challenge and I'll back you up. Elijah would not have done this without backup. I like that idea that Elijah was inspired to propose this experiment. Just think of that, divine inspiration, Holy Spirit. We can transfer that, as Dr. Brand said, we can have these moments of inspiration. The Lord is saying, go this direction or go that, and it <laughs> might open up new avenues for research. And in fact, getting back to the book, Douglas Axe has done some very specific experiments that were inspired by that kind of question, and they came out his way, and came out his way obviously enough that people couldn't stop them from being published. And I think that that's, you know, uh, part of the reason I'm reviewing the book is because I think the book is an interesting exercise in wh how do you know when the experts are pulling the wool over your eyes. But I think also it is a testimony of somebody who has put his faith to the test. And one of the things when we get done with the book is I want to go back and look at some of those experiments, what he did, how the logic was, and how the thing came out. Because I think that those kinds of things are tremendous faith builders when you realize that it actually works. And the only thing that's really left for you to do is to realize it works in your life, and then nobody can stop you. Anyway, come back next week and we'll, um, we'll go through the next uh, couple of chapters.